Well, good morning, guys. Glad to have you online with us today. Uh, thank you for joining us for our first ever NOBA Summit uh, by Zoom. And this is the first time we've ever done this. And I hope that you will uh, benefit from our Zoom meeting today. We have as our special guest, Mr. Dave Travis, who'll be speaking to us in just a moment. And we're glad that he has joined us today as well. We got a lot of guys on the line. And so just for sake of time, a little bit later, we're gonna introduce all of you, but we're glad that you're here. And we need to know a little bit more about your association, your size, length of ministry, that sort of thing. For those of you that don't know me, um, I serve as the national chairman of, of the NOBA conference. And in addition to that, we have on the line, Mr. Eddie Miller, who's been the national chairman for a number of years, helped get this group started back in the day. I won't say how many days that was, but it was back when Eddie had hair. He doesn't anymore, but uh, Eddie is on the line with us as well. We wanna welcome him and honor him for being with us and helping us get this group started. I think this is a very important group for us to uh, get together and to talk about things that are specific to associations and what uh, God is doing across the nation with associations. And um, I have been serving here at the Stone Mountain Association for the last 25 years as their missionary and uh, been very grateful for that. I plan to retire at the end of this year. So don't be sending me a lot of resumes. We already got some people to look at, but uh, basically I've already announced my retirement, but I plan to stay on and help my friends uh, with NOBA. In addition to uh, NOBA uh, leadership, I've got Daryl Price with me. He's came, kind of been my cohort in crime and Daryl is the missionary in the Noonday Baptist Association. And he is joined also by Kim Harris, and Kim's going to help us facilitate our meeting today. She's on uh, Daryl's staff, and we're glad that she is with us as well. In order to uh, be conscious of our time, if you are listening today, and if you're not talking, I want you to mute your microphone so we can hear our speaker. And uh, then when we have an opportunity afterwards, uh, we'll unmute the mics and open them up in order to do the introductions and that sort of thing. I want to introduce to you my friend. You always call on a friend when you need a favor, and I called on my friend and current deacon chairman of the Lithonia First Baptist Church here in our association to help us today. His name is Dave Travis. Dave is the director of strategic council to pastors and church boards with Generis located right here in Atlanta. He did a uh, pastor's roundtable by Zoom for me, and I thought the subject was so important and so pertinent that I wanted to have that subject shared with our NOBA group today as well. So Dave is going to talk to us about the K economy. Dave also has been a former associational missionary strategist himself, having been my predecessor and a large part of my life for the last 40 years. I knew Dave when he and I both had hair that wasn't gray anymore. But uh, basically, we're glad that Dave is with us. And Dave, I'm gonna let you take it from here. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Brother Larry. You may want to change your screen to maximize speaker view or something like that. So you'll be able to see my uh, audio visuals back here uh, behind me. I'm gonna talk first about what Larry asked me to talk about, which is the K-shape economy and, and why we have a K-shape economy and what the implications are. And then I've got several other trends. I think what I promised was four trends that are impacting our recovery from the pandemic. And I wanna talk about how churches have responded and what I see churches doing. In my work at Generis, the Director of Strategic Council to Pastors and Church Boards, I primarily work with larger churches in the area of pastor succession, in the area of what I call story crafting for strategy, which is essentially a form of strategy planning and then building better boards. Um, I work with everything from mainline churches to 
charismatic Pentecostal churches. I was with a client last week, or yesterday on that, last week with a mainline church, very large independent churches, a couple Southern Baptists along the way, a United Methodist, so a variety of churches. So the input I'm going to be giving you is not just focused on Southern Baptists, uh, even though that's my uh, home tradition. Uh, 25 years ago, when I left the Stone Mountain Association, I began to open up to the world of other evangelical churches and to work with them as well uh, on a regular basis. So let's get right into it. And I hope you can see my crude visuals uh, behind me here, and I'll try and bring them as close as I can, but you'll get the idea because they're very simple drawings. Uh, first of all, I need you to understand about you know, what's been happening in our economy in the last uh, really 20, 21 months. Um, the first drawing I have for you here is actually reflective of the U.S. gross, dash, gross uh, domestic product, which is the GDP, which just says, how is our economy doing? This is very important for churches. And as you know, last year in March, we had a recession. Looking back now in the last six weeks, it's been announced that you know, that recession was actually very short. We had a V-shot uh, since, last, since last June. The economy has crept up, up, up. It's now stronger and healthier than it was pre-pandemic. Um, the K-shape, which Larry alluded to, is how individuals, their financial fortunes, futures, wealth, their feelings about their wealth have changed since the beginning of the pandemic. This was first discussed last August by a couple of economists, and it's held true, I think, with churches as well. And so what we find in, in individuals is about, is a K. And what, what most economists described is about 20% of the people in our economy or in our churches and our mission field have actually prospered during this season. I'll get to some of the reasons for that in a minute. Uh, their financial fortunes have gone up. About 20% of the people said, and probably at least for the first 10 months of the recession, their financial fortunes went down, especially hard hit were areas like uh, tourism, hospitality industries uh, were at first hit hard, retail workers, uh, some uh, housekeeping workers in the hospitality sector uh, had uh, declines. And so we had some people that were really hurting uh, during the last, um, during this recession. But about 60% of the people they're doing okay. Their financial fortunes kind of stayed the same. And um, some of those were people who are like Larry is gonna be next year, retired, drawing on their either social security or other retirement investments. And so you have many people that you know fit that category that they're gonna do fine. We had some uh, government employees who still were drawing a check. Uh, some school teachers, even though they were teaching remotely, other people that you know continued to draw their income and were able to work and were able to earn, but it didn't really go up or down as far as their financial uh, condition. Um, now, when I ran this with uh, several of my client churches, now admittedly, most of these are larger churches. Um, they do reflect the diversity of race in our country though. Um, and I asked them, hey, if you're a congregation, how many people do you fit in each category? And they said, well, yeah, I can see where about 20% of our people were doing very well, about 60% of our people, but maybe the 60% maybe actually closer to 70 in our congregation. We really think that very few people are hurting because we've had all these funds given and we've been sharing with people that we have needs that we can help meet and we really haven't had that much demand for them. Part of that is not necessarily to the church's credit. Part of that's to our shame because the church in America has done kind of a poor job at serving poor uh, economic classes and poor people in most cases. But my favorite story there, I've got to tell this story. It's one of my favorites is a church friend of mine who's in the Chicago, Illinois area, who the chairman of the finance team at this church, large independent church, um, was in the... Uh, kind of the health line, the medical screening business. And the medical screening business, the way he operated it was they would go to a corporate site, big corporations, big uh, office buildings, 
and they would do these health screenings, you know, in exchange for the corporate kind of paid for it. Um, people were able to diagnose problems early like diabetes, uh, certain other conditions that they were able to test for and get people help immediately. Um, when the economy kind of shut down, we went into lockdown. Uh, the pastor could not get a hold of this person, this entrepreneur, and he finally did. And he said, man, uh, you know, my life has just gone to hell in the handbasket because I'm about to lose everything. No one is doing medical testing uh, like we were doing, and we're about to lose it all. I've had to lay off 300 employees in the last two weeks. Um, he said, well, I'm going to be praying for you. I'll get back to you. Um, the pastor tried to call this individual every week so that they could minister to him and could check on him and make sure he wasn't uh, going to dive off the deep end and never could get a hold of him. Finally, the guy called him back and he said, Pastor, I'm so sorry I haven't called you back. He said, I pivoted to the COVID testing business. He said, not only have I hired everybody back, but I need to find 200 more people to come to work. Um, and he said, what I've decided to do, because God, he says, I believe it's because God saved my business. He said, um, I've decided to give all the profits from the medical testing business uh, to kingdom work in the next year. I think that illustrates two things. Number one, um, entrepreneurs and the health of our economy is because of entrepreneurs creating new ways to serve people, uh, doing new things. The second thing is that uh, people are willing to give and to um, invest in kingdom work if we have a close relationship with them, just like this pastor kept after this person. All right, I'm going to get to the next part of our story here. So the next part of our story, this goes back to that K-shaped thing, is that for many people, their income stayed the same throughout the last 21 months or did better, as we said, the 20%. However, what we said at the beginning of the pandemic and I hope you can see this, is that their expenses went down. People weren't eating out as much, didn't use as much gas. Uh, many people did not take a vacation in 2020. Their expenses dropped. Those expenses have gone up a little bit since then, uh, though we still have uh, people spending less than they're taking in across the whole of the economy. What that fed was all this extra kind of cash flowed into what, what the economists call um, checkable accounts or investments. And at the beginning of the recession in uh, March of 2020, there were $19 trillion in checkable accounts. Uh, that includes checking accounts, savings account, money market funds, anything you could write a check on and have liquid uh, within seven days, uh, you could access. That's the kind of money, $19 trillion were in the United States checkable accounts owned by individuals. A month ago, I didn't check today's number or August number, but in July, at uh, the beginning of August of 2021, there was $39 trillion in those same accounts. In other words, more than double the amount of money in checkable accounts. Now, some of you will say, oh, well, that's all those stimulus checks. Well, that's some of it. Um, but what really happened was people reduced their expenditure and they didn't know what to do with the money. Or those who didn't buy a new house or uh, build a new deck or do something outside, uh, they flowed that money into their savings and checking. The big point I usually try and make here is the money is out there if we have a meaningful, plausible, relevant story to tell that asks for people to invest in the kingdom. Many of the churches I work with, I know every church is different. They didn't see, they had fairly good financial years last year. Now, some of that's driven by things like the PPP money that many churches took advantage of and, and put into account and they didn't have dramatic reversals in their income. You know, some churches pivoted very quickly if they didn't have it already, to online giving. Online giving tends to be more recurring giving. People can give on a regular basis. That actually helps church finances in the long term. Um, but churches didn't have that bad of a year if they had a bad year at all. Many had a very good year um, because they actually created ministries and programs that people saw as helping. And uh, a lot of people, especially those in the 20% going up, 
said, we want to help. We want to be a help to people. And so they gave generously to the church. A lot of that money is still sitting in checkable accounts. Uh, what I've been telling many of my clients is this is the best fall ever to do a uh, vision initiative or a generosity initiative to ask for those resources. Again, you got to have a meaningful, plausible, relevant story. Um, the second thing is those visions can't just be for capital, can't just be for new buildings because people have realized that the building may not be as important. I'll come to that a little bit later. Um, but those that do have building needs, now's the time to ask for those and kind of get some of those met uh, because there are people that have money to give right now. The other thing that we do have at least extending, we had it last year, we'll have it through the end of this year, is that for um, those people that have uh, high adjustable gross incomes or even small adjustable gross incomes, this year and last year, you could give up to 100% of that adjustable gross income to the charity of your choice. It had to be in cash, can't come out of a foundation or a private uh, donor advised fund. But you could give that this year and 100% of that would be deductible. And so it would be like having no income for the whole year. And so if you had cash that you have available um, to give, that you've just been saving in these accounts, and let's say your income was $50,000, but you gave $50,000 to your church, your tax liability this year would be zero. Um, and so for certain sophisticated donors, that's a very important thing. Um, and they don't like paying the government money and they could see the opportunities of that. Uh, you can also, you can give less than 100% of your AGI, that's also would be deductible. So, um, the other thing to understand about our economy is uh, and why we have so much wealth available right now is I'm just going to give you a couple of market statistics here. The Dow Jones Industrial Average, uh, 320. Uh, we had a dip from 820 or essentially a year to year, year over year. And I looked at this again this morning, year over year. So since this time last year, the Dow Jones is up 25%. And so if you left your money in your retirement account that was invested in market-based funds, you saw growth last year. You saw growth in the past year, 25% growth. Uh, for those of who, just to give another kind of market kind of test, the S&P 500, the broader market, uh, we were up uh, in the last year, last 12 months. Uh, we that also had a dip, but it's also up. It's up 32% in the last year, a third more value in the market. What that means is people feel wealthier if they have retirement savings. And about half of America does have retirement savings. And if it's invested in market funds, they feel like they have more money to give or have more money available to them for the future. Um, our task is to ask and to have that invested in kingdom resources. The other thing we did have is we did have a season, it's kind of rebounded now, where debt went down across the, the board in America. Um, People, you know, and as is in all recessions, in all recessions, the debt load that people will carry drops because they apply more money to paying off debt because they want to be feel more financially secure. It's risen back up now, um, but that's kind of what, what happened there. The other... Um, I don't know if anybody's tried to buy a new car or truck. Uh, the other reason debt load went down is after the first round of cars and trucks were sold, no one can find a new car or new truck to buy in many of the brands because of uh, supply chain issues. Finally, and this is good news. Um, and it was, we even had an update this week from the Census Bureau. The rate of child poverty went down since the recession started or since the pandemic started. Uh, the Census Bureau reported, I think it was two days ago now, the imputed level of poverty for families also dropped about two percentage points from 11 points to nine. Um, what that means is the imputed rate means that taking into account all governmental benefits uh, given to families in poverty uh, and what that raises their standard to uh, 
and I don't want to see anybody in poverty, but the good news is that poverty has dropped because of some of those governmental supports that have been enacted through this pandemic. Um, so that's the kind of the economic scene of the K shape that I did want to communicate to you. But there's a couple other trends I want to talk about that, um, oh, by the way, forgot one thing. Home equity is at a record, $1.5 trillion uh, growth in home equity over the last year. Um, I don't know about where you live, um, but the value of our homes has risen because there's not enough supply in many parts of the country. About 80% of the country doesn't have enough supply for the buyers that want to buy. Um, and then also the IRA and retirement funds in America hit a new record as well this summer. Um, there's more money in IRAs and retirement funds. For some sophisticated givers, we'll know that if you're past 70, uh, you can give parts of your retirement fund in a tax advantage way, part of your RMD or the whole of your RMD, if you want, of certain IRAs. Uh, and that yields a, a tax benefit to you. Uh, consult your tax advisor, of course, but that's, that's good news. All right, the second trend I want to talk about today uh, so those are the economic ones, but these are the ones that have impacted throughout the whole of, of the church life. And I want to talk about the three Ps. Actually, I want to talk about six Ps, but I'm going to start with three. Three is the shift from that churches have experienced. And so this is the shift from platform to pastoral to personal. We had in American culture, most we had tied up many churches had tied up their whole ministry as to what happens on Sunday and the weekend and what happens on the platform. And they were able to pivot a lot of that during the pandemic to some digital delivery, but it was still about what happens there. I think what we've seen the value of is a return to the pastoral uh, touch and the pastoral approach. And this goes back to what I was talking about in the economy thing about uh, the pastor who reached out to his finance committee. The winners have been those who are going to work to have those pastoral relationships with people. Um, and by pastoral, I don't just mean a clergy person. I mean a heart-to-heart -heart shepherd relationship uh, that people have uh, in, in forming us that way. And so um, that is why those churches that um, had strong small group and shepherding systems continued to thrive through this pandemic. Um, those churches that were very focused on the platform uh, tended to struggle. Uh, this is why many of our charismatic Pentecostal brothers who were all focused on Sunday morning and you know, and people aren't coming back and they feel depressed as opposed to uh, several churches I work with had more in community groups than ever before, uh, even today, even though those community groups may have been conducted virtually during the pandemic and they remain very strong and healthy because it wasn't all based on what happens on the weekend or what all happens in their kids ministry or youth ministry or in big groups but the pastoral thing is important and then finally getting down to personal what we've realized again through this pandemic is the importance of personal touches and personal relationships uh people to people relationships pastor to people relationships and discipleship uh, nurture relationships, going deep with a few people on a regular basis and making sure we touch people in a personal way. So the three P's I think are continuing to play out, especially in the recovery and the re-engagement of churches is that people aren't just looking for a great platform show or you know what happens on Sunday. That's important for some people, but moving from the platform to pastoral and then to personal realizing that's what's going to be vitally important to people on uh, the next season. Now, we did have some conflict during the pandemic, and then I'm not telling you guys anything that you don't know, especially in your roles. Uh, and here again, I've got three more Ps. Um, what I had a lot of churches and large churches were especially susceptible to this is struggles over these three Ps. Number one, politics. We had the pandemic hit in the worst possible year for America because we were in the middle of a political campaign and everybody had to take sides or everybody seemed to want to take sides and to claim one side or the other was speaking for God. And so politics became an issue even at board levels where I tend to work. 
as some boards and pastors wanted to take one side or the other or speak to one side's issues or the others. And what we found was 80% of the people didn't care. The ones we hear about are at the extremes of the right or the left or on Facebook or on cable news or something like that. But politics is one of the P's. The second P is the issues related to the pandemic, which we are still seeing in the county where I live, Gwinnett County, Georgia. Uh, there's still school boards fighting over things like masks, vaccinations, uh, et cetera. Uh, the pandemics and the politics of the pandemic have impacted us. And I had several churches struggling with how are we going to uh, change our policies to fit pandemic environments? Uh, we got we were very fortunate, of course, uh, early on in 2021, where the virus uh, seemed to be easing with the Delta variant seems to be rising, a little more fear back in the system, attendance kind of leveling off, dropping, engagement dropping. Um, I think we're going to come out of that in the next 30 days, but uh, that has had an impact as far as the Delta variant. And finally, the issues around persons of color, uh, just to give it a P, is that the, the long-term simmering issues of race in America are still with us, and that had a big impact last year. Uh, many of those issues have been kind of forgotten uh, in this current year, but they will resurface uh, as we go forward. Um, I'm gonna say the last, or, or one of the other trends that we clearly saw was the shift from physical to digital. And uh, most of the churches I know, including my own small church, 125 people pre-pandemic, you know, shifted to virtual transmission of their worship services and their prayer meeting. Uh, and, so, and that was the kind of the big overall, you know, the headline was all the churches that all of a sudden became multi-campus. They have a virtual campus and a live campus. Um, now, some people treated that as a broadcast. Some people treated like that as a kind of real campus. Um, those churches that I know that have extended their digital ministry to small groups, to pastor focus areas, ask me any things, um, any way of personal touching people, pastor discipleship groups or uh, discipleship groups that were uh, core, like five week groups going deep with a small group uh, led by a pastor have continued to excel and have continued to find residents there. Uh, for those churches of yours that have recovery ministries, you know, recovery ministry was very resistant at all to any digital kind of group meetings because of the lack of anonymity factors. Um, but those recovery ministries that shifted to a digital expression found they could have more meetings, facilitate them easier, and reach more people uh, through those uh, expressions. I work with several clients that have um, discipleship programs. And so, for example, one of my clients that I work with is called Emotionally Healthy Leadership and Emotionally Healthy Discipleship. And they always claim we could never do our program with churches digitally until they had to. And once they did, they found they could have deeper conversations actually with people in a digital environment than they could in a face-to-face uh, -face environment. And they actually increased participation. If some of your churches use a program like Alpha or Rooted, um, they also saw increases in the last year of participation uh, because they were able to do it. One of my clients as well in the last couple of years has been a program called Better Man. And Better Man is a kind of master teacher facilitated table discussion thing around manhood issues. And they expected last year to reach 2,500 people in their live events. Instead, they reached 15,000 people through digital expressions of their program. And these are usually, um, I think Better Man is a 10 week program uh, where people have to commit to come to all 10 weeks and they, they saw dramatic improvement. So this is that expression from physical to digital environments. The digital environment is still gonna be with us. Um, I think it's gonna be very challenging for some churches to move to this, but it's also a, a place of great opportunity for even small churches to build uh, digital discipleship groups, to build digital expressions uh, with very simple technologies, at least right now, um, if they'll do it. This is a change of behavior in pastors that, you know, changes of behavior is hard when we've been socialized and trained in one era or one style, one approach, and then have to shift to another one. Um, but I think it does have opportunities uh, for us. Um, 
the the uh, that's four trends. I'm going to give you a bonus one now, and I don't know how this one's going to play out. This is speculation. I'll, you know, th there's a season right now we call the Great Resignation. And the three R's here are resignation, retirement, and refocus. I'm gonna start with refocus. What the pandemic brought in many people's lives, especially in the lockdown season and what followed, is a chance to rethink and refocus their life about what really matters. And some people just decided things like, I'm working too hard. We saw youth sports drop dramatically and it hasn't come back yet. And so the refocus for many families that had kids in youth sports said, you know what? We can live without baseball, soccer, football, basketball. That was wearing us out. We kind of like not having to do that. And so that refocus is a chance for churches to help people reorient their lives to things that matter, things of meaning. Um, the question is, will we do it? Will we take advantage of that? Or will we go back and just say, well, you know, we're going to continue to run the same program we ran pre-pandemic. We have this great opportunity in people's hearts and minds right now to help them to refocus. What that refocus drove, or is driving right now, is this thing that um, Gallup calls the great resignation. When they did a survey earlier this year, 38% of American workers, and you got to remember, only about half of America is working. Some people are retired. Some people have disabilities, some people are children <laughs> who, who aren't working yet. But 38% uh, of the workers said they probably don't plan to be in this job for another year. Either they're disengaged with this job or through this refocusing process, they've decided this is not the work for me. Uh, that's gonna create some problems in our economy. Uh, as you know, and I don't know about your area, there are many, uh, occupations and uh, businesses that can't find enough workers right now. Uh, I was in Knoxville, Tennessee last week and passed restaurant after restaurant that just said, we can't hire enough workers to reopen. Um, these tend to be lower paying uh, jobs. Uh, I have several other restaurant owners I've talked to that said, well, we're only gonna open for 32 hours a week because that's all we can get workers for. And so we're gonna to have to focus our work on 32 hours a week, those that we think will be the most profitable for us. Um, also in white collar jobs, as people realize they were working themselves to death, and uh, these include a lot of, hey, look, I'm willing to sacrifice income and swap it for time. The other thing that's happening in the workforce, of course, and this does have impacts for churches, is uh, the rise of remote work. That's only about a third of America. It was higher during the peak of the pandemic. We think about a third of America, you know, really desires to work remotely and can work remotely. But that's gonna change some of what, especially churches in metropolitan areas where there are long commutes, it's gonna change some lifestyle patterns. That could be good things for the church. I don't know how to take advantage of them just yet but I think there will be opportunities for us. And finally, the great retirement, the, re the age of retirement in America has dropped. The average age for retirement currently in America is now 62 years old. So Larry, you waited too long, buddy. Um, the, uh, as people have decided that, you know, it's time to step out of the workforce. Part of that's driven by the things I showed you about the wealth growth, especially in investment and retirement accounts among some people. And then part of it is just people saying, you know what, I'm tired of this. <clears throat> I'm checking out. There are opportunities here for churches to leverage people that are able to retire early uh, to use, as my good friend George Bullard always said, mission mobilizers, uh, 22 people who give uh, 22 hours a week, 44 weeks a year, or 11 hours a week, uh, 33 weeks a year to a mission vital cause um, that, has, that gives them meaning in life, but they don't need the income. Uh, to sustain their simple lifestyles uh, to go forward. And so I think this uh, resignation, retirement, and refocus trend uh, are, give, do give us some opportunities. Uh, all right, one more bonus, and then I'll get to questions. And that is, I do think the 70-30 rule still applies. Let me tell you what the 70-30 rule is. Uh, 
I first heard it articulated by Kenan Callahan back in 1990, where he said effective growing churches focus 70% of their considerations towards outsiders and 30% towards insiders. Uh, he said stagnant and declining churches focus 70% of their energy, time, resources, consideration toward insiders and only 30% towards outsiders. I would say that uh, Callahan was being optimistic. Uh, this is not to say the whole of our focus needs to be on outsiders, but we always need to consider how would an outsider see this? How would an outsider respond to this? If an outsider walked into our doors or we invited them, how would they interpret or see what we are doing? It doesn't say we orient, it says we always have that consideration in mind when we're doing our planning. Uh, my experience through the pandemic is that churches have really focused on, we gotta get people back. And I'm not saying that's a bad focus. I'm, I'm just saying, let's don't forget the opportunity we have, even in this season, to have outsiders, people outside of our fellowship, outside of our, um, normal circles of concern uh, to be invited to participate with us. In fact, we have all these new opportunities where they can be engaged in us uh, in pastoral and personal ways uh, through this season. Okay, Larry, I think I've rambled on enough. Uh, a few more things I could say, but I'll, I'll save those for the questions. So uh, have at it, how you wanna do this, Larry? Well, I'm looking to see what kind of questions we may have. I hadn't seen any pop up in the chat right now, Dave, but uh, you gave us some great information. Um, one of the things that you just said that resonated with me, and maybe I'll start with a question, okay. is um, that it seems to me with the churches that I'm working with, that our people are more concerned about what you said, getting people back but the harvest is in the people that are not yet reached. And we're not doing anything in that regard to reach them. Um, Kim Harris has put on here, talk a little about digital discipleship. Who's doing a good job of that? So the churches that are doing a good job of that, number one, many of them already had great small group systems that they could shift to virtual environments and they did. And many of those virtual environments now uh, at least in, they've moved them back to kind of live meeting. And uh, many of those were home groups. Many of those were uh, workplace groups. But, you know, the great thing about Zoom is, you know, even with a free account, you can connect people for 40 minutes at a time. Um, the second thing is I had several churches that during the peak of the pandemic, um, when the staff, they got their PPP loan to pay staff, but many churches didn't have work for staff because the work was so focused on platform. And so the pastors would say, okay, each of you need to be discipling five people in a weekly kind of context, and probably you should do two groups. And so uh, they set up essentially almost like discovery Bible studies with people within their fellowship to start with and said, for the next five weeks, we're going to gather. We're going to go through uh, this section of scripture. Here's how we're going to do it. We're going to use like a Discover Bible study or a scripture observation application prayer method or something to that effect um, where they were letting their pastors engage with people that they knew needed to be discipled. And the, the, the bar, the, the ask was low. Will you be a part of a, a group for five uh, weeks with me that meets Tuesday mornings at 7 a.m. You say, well, that's kind of a high bar. I don't get up before then. Well, whatever the meeting time they set and they explained, you know, what they were going to be doing, that helped them form relationships. It also helped model, especially if they had an apprentice, ways to multiply that uh, within their fellowship. They found that engaged people at a heart level because it was a small group, you know, usually five people plus the pastor or one of the pastors or one of the clergy, one of the staff. Um, but it became a modeling way of connecting people in very small discipleship groups. Um, you know, some people make the distinction of discipleship group may be less than five or six or four. Uh, and then the, uh, the, the next level up would be a small group, which might be 12. Uh, then you have more gathered groups, which are larger things. 
Um, I got a question here from Wesley Smith. Do you consider just the streaming worship digital ministry? No. I think that is um, broadcast ministry. And I think it's nice. Uh, but I, I think digital ministry has to engage people that attend that service. It has to create ways that we are directly connecting with individuals in that. The, the big mistake I saw even in large churches was if they didn't have a digital uh, broadcast, they moved to that, but they made no attempt to properly connect with the people attending that digital broadcast by using things such as uh, text, short text uh, kind of connection or uh, moderated facilitated um, uh, online environments, you know, there, there's several of the online.church and several of these other platforms that do enable that uh, to, to connect with people and to um, drive that kind of engagement. Um, I had several churches uh, who went, had a, a digital broadcast, which was hosted, and then they also were able to buy TV time on low rent cable when it gets right down to it, um, to to kind of have a the same recorded broadcast um, kind of for their people. But they would always put screens up that said, look, if, if you don't have a Bible, text this number. We want to come give you a Bible. Or you have a food need, text this number. If you have a prayer need, text this number. Or here's how to connect with us so that we can pray for you. And they had, you know, actually pretty good response for the Bible distribution, for the prayer needs. Uh, from people that they didn't know. And so then it becomes a, the methodology of help, helping to train the staff. And, you know, some churches, as high as they dedicated 30% of their staff time, now these are large churches, mind you, to their digital expressions instead of their physical expressions. The mistakes I saw in a lot of churches, especially mainline churches, which wouldn't necessarily connect with you guys, was the staff just essentially because they weren't focused on Sunday and gatherings. They said, oh, you know, I'm not going to do anything. I'm still getting paid and I'll do things as they come up, but I'm not going to really try and build a digital expression of our ministry uh, beyond this. All right, uh, a couple of uh, things. I got to go up here. Uh, a couple of things. My, I work for, currently work for a, a, a company called Generis. If you go to generis.com backslash Dave-Travis, you'll see my page, but generis.com, primarily known for their capital stewardship and fundraising. I don't do that type of work, but um, I work on the effective ministry team, which helps churches to be more effective in their ministries. What is Dave seeing in networks, associations, good, bad, ugly? If you were leading an associ Baptist association, what would you do? Well, um, let me come back to that. Ask that one again in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get these other things out of the way. Uh, haven't thought about that in a while. Uh, Larry's heard me expound on it occasionally, but. Uh, uh, My assumption is you would retire, uh, run or something like that. No, no. no. <laughs> but no, but I, I asked that question just so you know, just because we are a group of Baptist associations and we're dealing with all kind of, of the stuff that you've, and it's been great. Dave, I appreciate Larry getting you speaking into us. So I do want you to speak into it, but I, I also just have to say this for the sake of many. Uh, I appreciate seeing your office because I think a clean desk is the sign of a sick mind. So, so you are affirming to me today. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just got back last night from a trip. Part of that. It would be a little cleaner, but. Um, so. Uh, I think on digital ministry, uh, there are several churches I can I have to pull those out. Um, digital discipleship, I think the church, here again, the churches have done the kind of the online D groups and things like that uh, have done well. Uh, Larry, one of the churches that we worked with, or actually you you worked with me on this one, uh, Cross Timbers Church, Argyle, Texas has done a great job with uh, having their digital campus, digital ministry, building that to build uh, uh, CT online and the small groups that meet out of that. Um, 12 stone here in this area of Georgia has not, has done okay with that. Uh, 
they did a great job at sh shifting their thinking from platform to kind of micro expressions and things like that. Um, let's see, there's another message down here. How can the church address their labor shortages? Wesley, help me out there what you mean by that. You mean volunteer? Well, I'm speaking volunteer and staff. I mean, I, I think we're going to see the, the gap both in the staffing issue, but also, you know, volunteers. That's one of the things I'm hearing our churches are having to cut way back on the, the ministries that, and some of these ministries are necessary, but they just don't have volunteers that have returned to do those. Yep. Okay. Gotcha. There's a resource, I think on my page at generis.com backslash Dave dash Travis. If not, my friend, Jessica Beeler, one of my colleagues at Generis wrote a great resource on, I don't know if it's called Reengaging Volunteers, but it is in that line. You'll see it there. I would look at that. I do think there's marvelous opportunities on the staff side and other sides for uh, what, here again, what George Bullard called the 2244 Mission Mobilizers. And this is capturing those people who are exiting the workforce to join our, at least our volunteer staff teams. I talked, I work with several churches in helping set up their residency programs and internship programs. Admittedly, these are large churches, okay? Um, but they've now started senior residencies, which are for people who are either retired early or already retired who wanna be a part of the residency program and give the next five years of their life really to serving the church in a unique way. Many of those senior resident programs and, and large church programs actually know they can't deploy all that help in their church. And so they're training residents, especially in a little more rural contexts, to go out and serve other churches, essentially as um, staff or uh, part-time staff or free staff. Um, I think there's marvelous opportunities here. The challenge is um, having a pastor that, that knows how to articulate that well and can articulate that it's not going to be a full-time role, but it's going to be and I love George's description, 44 weeks a year and 22 hours a week uh, for some of those, or you can adjust that accordingly. I think what a lot of volunteers are reticent right now is they, and, and this was a learned behavior through the pandemic, if it hadn't already hit folks, is the commitment to every week, every week ministry is hard for many volunteers to make. And so we have to design systems and approaches, and I don't have any great ideas here, that share the ministry over a whole year and where we can either alternate team, uh, make it a, um, a better experience. And then we also, I think what you're really hitting on here, Wesley, is the need, uh, I, I called it last year, the forward focus framework, and then we've got to radically simplify our ministries into what it's essential core and what we have to do. You know, I have had several, here again, larger, mid-sized churches, you know, not super large, that have changed their children's ministry approach because of the pandemic. And so um, they've consolidated some classes, but built, you know, a table group ministry that, uh, that has kind of the master teacher kind of approach or the, what I used to call the Uncle Henry approach. But then uh, at tables, they would have leaders that are just leading a table and making that very easy for a volunteer to lead a table. Um, the other thing I, I saw more of, and I don't see it as much now, uh, but I was seeing is churches that moved their kids ministry to be the same time as the worship service. And it was kind of the kids room where they were seeing the service on video for part of the service. And then there were some activities that were planned around the message theme that were facilitated and what they said is if you want to bring your child to worship we need one adult to go with their children to this and you'll still hear the message see the message but we're also going to have some activities for children in this other space um, that you'll help facilitate with your child that was designed to to provide a little bit of comfortability because of the virus spread um, i think we're over some of that fear not all of it um, but that was a way they facilitated that was without kind of the volunteer driven uh, engagement that we would usually have with Sunday school extended session, kind of those types of ministries. Um, I think what this has been, uh, 
on, on some other ministries. Like I, I had a pastor say, you know, we can't get anybody to volunteer for our men's ministry to come out on either a certain evening or a certain morning uh, to do some of our men's ministry things. And I'm like, well, why are you still doing that? Did you ever have you know, big attendance? And it's like, yeah, we might. But I said, occasionally we would have a special speaker. I'm like, well, I would transfer all that to a digital expression um, and fulfill it that way. I do think we have, ch I, I've talked to several churches that have gone back to live meeting for their recovery ministry, but they're having trouble finding childcare workers for that. And I, I kind of get that. Um, but here again, as we shifted to digital, digital may have worked better than we think. Dave, what can you say more about the uh, persons of color since some of us are in urban and metro areas? Yeah. And you said that's going to be something that's going to be long term, is going to be with us a while. What else could you say in that regard? Well, that's another subject, I'm sure. That's a whole, well, we've had, you know, racial issues in America have been with us since the founding of America. So let me just start there. Um, the issues around race and justice, which came to the fore last year. Uh, many pastors needed help addressing and needed help listening to different perspectives. Let's just say it that way. Um, and as churches made that either uh, a key focus of their church, um, they found the polarities within their congregation. I had one of my uh, client churches, large church, South Carolina, about 10,000 people. And uh, one of their teaching pastors in a message last June said, I want you to understand here at our church, we do believe that black life matters. Didn't say black lives. We didn't say black life matters. Um, and he said, I mean, we believe that because we believe all people uh, need to be redeemed by Jesus. Now, this is a church that has about 10% of their fellowship or people of color. Um, he said the very next week, he had a group of, of about 50 members come to him and said unless that pastor walks that back we are leaving the church and the pastor senior pastor of this church said don't let the screen door hit you on your way out and he said i can tell you one thing he said um if we go from a church of ten thousand to a church of five thousand and it's over this issue we'll be a better church um he says i'm not trying to run anybody off but if they're going to make an issue out of this, I don't need them. Um, he did lose a thousand people over that issue. He said, we're a better place. He said, they had missed a lick, by the way, in other engagement measures. So, um, so that, that was his kind of story. And I think that um, Larry in our own fellowship or and locally, as you know, we have a, uh, good dialogue between pastors of, of not only race, uh, distinction, but language dis distinction. We need to be talking and listening to one another. We need to be having those sister church relationships, especially uh, my church is about 50% people of power, as I say, and 50% people of color, uh, where we are hearing each other and listening with one another. I see a couple other things. What engagement measures are you tracking? So I think it begins with well, it, it goes back to first, how many people are attending with us live uh, and are in gathered expressions? And then how many people are in small groups, either digital or in person? Um, what's our giving? And this is the number of households that are giving uh, multiplied by the number of people in that household. Because um, I think that is a key measure, just as Jesus said, uh, where our heart is, there our treasure is also, or where our treasure is, there our heart is also. And then um, how many people are serving? And serving doesn't necessarily have to be in a gathered environment. Uh, I have had several churches that have set up prayer ministries and other ministries where people can be connected and serve even in remote ways uh, that aren't quite ready to come back. So that would be my that. What books am I currently reading? I did read O.S. Hawkins' new book over the weekend about George Truitt and uh, Frank Norris, which I thought was fascinating. Uh, part of that story uh the other book i have over there is a book called russo's dog but that's a philosophy book i don't know why i'm reading 
But yeah, I have too many books and you can see them all around me here. They're my friends. Thank you, Dave, for what you shared with us today. We're going to wrap it up unless somebody has a, another very pressing question that you have for Dave. I want to thank you for giving your time to us today, speaking into these association missionaries, and hopefully you've uh, stirred our hearts. Uh, you've stirred mine in regard to what George Bullard had said, and I caught that real quick in regard to mission mobilizers and uh, I think you've already given us a way that we can get in touch with you and it's in our chat box. So we're very grateful for that as well. Anybody yeah. got a last question? I know George, I don't know if George is here today, but George is also retiring into this year. Yes, or, he is. Or, or next year, or sometime soon. Yeah. As, as an associational missionary in Columbia. Right. Anyone else have a question for Dave? Hey, I'm going to ask. Uh, Daryl Price, are you still on the line? How about praying for Dave and his ministry? He's got a vital ministry in our area and across the nation and working with a lot of churches that a lot of folks are following. And uh, we need to pray for him as he leaves. Daryl, could you lead us in the prayer? Sure. Thank you very much, Dave. On behalf of all of us, thank you for just, I love the overview. I love the, the depth you gave. So thank you very much. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you that uh, we know that you have promised us that you will not leave us nor forsake us. And Father, we come to a place and we see the opportunities that abound. We know uh, that you put Dave in a place for 25 years ago where he's left the associational work to do uh, leadership network and help lead lots of things and continues to stir and help people be effective in ministry. We pray you will bless him. Give him insight and wisdom. Give him uh, the, the, what he needs. You know everything about him. You know his health, his emotional states, his financial realities. You know the opportunities locally and abroad. And we pray, Father, you will just continue to allow him to be uh, abiding in you and you will draw him close to you and he'll have some of the deepest fellowship ever with you. And out of that relationship with you, he will have fruitfulness, that fruit that remains. I pray that you will uh, help him in every way, every aspect of his life. And, and we pray that you'd just allow him to come back and speak into our lives as associations and leaders. Uh, we thank you for his investment in us today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dave. All right. We're going to open up our lines here in a minute and let you guys tell us about um, your association, those kind of things. I'm going to uh, pass the leadership of our meeting on to uh, Kim Harris, who's online with us, so that Kim can uh, introduce our missionaries about takeaways from last year and what we need to do in that regard, uh, what these other missionaries have seen. And uh, then if you have questions for them, we can try to pose those questions as well. So Kim? How about taking over, please? Sounds good. Thank you so much for being here today. We certainly did enjoy um, Dave, and I've got a bunch of notes over here that I'm going to try to go back and read and digest through uh, the rest of the week. Um, um, look at that. But we have three different um, director of missions, AMSs, that they're going to kind of have a panel discussion right now and kind of uh, discuss some of the things and the issues that have been um, on their hearts and minds over these last year. But whenever um, the three are West Smith at Three Forks Baptist Association in Boone, North Carolina, and all three of these are from very different types of associations. But you've got West Smith, Mark Millman, who is at Southwest Wisconsin Baptist Association, which is in a, a mission area. And then we also have Jason Loudermilk, who is at West Metro Association in Douglasville, North uh, Georgia. So um, each one of all three of you are on here, and I want you to, to introduce yourself and just tell a little bit about your association and the setting that you're in, and then we'll kind of go from there. Wes, you want to take it away? Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Kim. Glad to be uh, on here with everybody today. Some great information. Uh, my name is Wesley Smith. I serve as the uh, Director of Missions for the Three Forks Baptist Association in Boone. And, and yeah, uh, I'm trying to rub it in with the background behind me back there. That is Grandfather Mountain, uh, one of our 
uh, great peaks here in Western North Carolina. But uh, God brought us here in November, uh, transitioned from Shelby, North Carolina, uh, association similar, uh, town and country uh, in Shelby, both town and country here as well in the Three Forks Association, but just a little bit north or, uh, northwest uh, of, of where we were in Shelby. Uh, so I had a unique type deal in transitioning in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that here in just a little bit. Okay. Uh, Jason Loudermilk. Well, hey, I'm Jason Loudermilk. Um, I serve at the, um, can y'all hear me? Okay. I can. I, uh, I serve at the uh, West Metro Baptist Association, uh, just west of uh, Atlanta in the metro area. And our association is unique in that we um, we go from a very urban area right close to the perimeter all the way out to some very rural uh, ministry context uh, for some of our churches on the far west side. And uh, so we have a unique kind of uh, difference of, um, uh, of types of churches as well as uh, we live in an area that has changed pretty dramatically demographically, both racially and uh, in socioeconomic makeup. And so um, it's been a unique uh, experience to work here. We have 52 churches, and uh, I have been in this role for the past four and a half years. Uh, before that, I was a pastor in the association, which was fantastic transitioning into it. I already had relationships with all of our pastors. And uh, so that's me. And Mark Millman. Is Mark on here? Mark, Mark Millman. I'm a association minister strategist for the Southern Wisconsin Baptist Association. So we're 30 churches in about 25 counties. But we, we really only have three associations in all of Wisconsin. The association above us had dissolved about 10 years ago. Some people call it has more deer per square mile than people. But we are pretty spread out and been here 16 years. I'm also the church planning council for the state of Wisconsin with North American Mission Board. Okay. Mark, um, let's let you start first with the first question. The first one is, how did you respond to the challenges that you faced with COVID last year in your association? Mark's going to do that, and then we're all they're all going to kind of hop on here. So why don't you answer that one first? Well, I'd say one of the best ideas actually came when we were starting to meet with our finance team. And our finance team, we have a couple, I call them older, wiser guys on there. And they said, why don't we call through all the churches to see what their needs are? So we actually, as the stewardship team, believe it or not, we called through every church uh, about three or four times. Uh, one, one item that really came up was, you know, like, hey, we're, we're not meeting. We're not sure what to do. Of course, they were also getting resources from the state convention on live streaming. Uh, but we actually helped people just purchase Zoom subscriptions out of the association budget. Like we just sent them basically, you know, it's $149.95 plus tax for a year. So just send them $150 checks to get going on Zoom. That's one thing we did. Another piece, and of course, I know you, a lot of you guys did this with glue. Uh, we did glue. We had one church in particular that led out with that. And uh, we actually had that pastor do a webinar. And he's, you know, they found out about the needs of the church. They actually asked the additional questions. You know, you get the 14 standard questions. But he, he, they found about needs, but they also found people that could meet the needs in the church. And, and they did that. And that, that, was, that webinar was actually very helpful. Uh, we, we really did try to reach out uh, also with webinars. So, you know, we had a lot of different webinars and, you know, one, a couple of buddies of mine that have written books, uh, one that has just come out, Bob Burton, Dr. Bob Burton is the DNA, spiritual DNA of a local church on mission. And we had Bob do that. We've actually purchased the books and mailed them out individually to all the pastors during the pandemic. Uh, but things like that were well received. Uh, we did other things, you know, with assessments as, and, as well. So those were some things we did that we felt were very helpful and the church has really responded. And that, that contact uh, by the stewardship team really helped catalyze a lot of that. Good. Wes, how did you, uh, your churches, how did you respond to those challenges? You know, in Shelby, we were already using technology in a great way, and so we were able to help our churches embrace that a lot. But when I transitioned to Three Forks to an area that hadn't had a leader in like 18 months, it was a little bit more difficult. We had to reestablish some communication, um, you know, creating um, some Facebook groups and, and um 
I created a pastor's weekly email update uh, to try to begin to get some information to them and, and trying to get the right information to them. But I think one of the things that I had to do initially, and this would have happened regardless pandemic or not, but I think it did play into a lot of what Mark mentioned in the fact that we ramped up, uh, you know, personal contact, making phone calls. Our uh, ministry assistant here calls a church every week uh, to uh, put them in the church weekly update, which we do by email. So she gets information from them. So she calls the pastor. And then I was also kind of following up with some different churches with phone calls, making sure that we sent personal cards, uh, just really trying to wrap up some of that personal contact and being intentional about reaching out to them personally, finding out what was going on in their lives. We've got some older pastors in our association. Uh, some of them uh, had did get COVID. We had one older pastor that got COVID twice. And so we were, we were spending a lot of time just checking in and making sure people knew that we cared about them and encouraging them. Uh, so I, I think that was one of the uh, the cool things that we did. Also, in uh, put into place a resource of the quarter, uh, just trying to get some some helpful information to them. I started out just kind of saying, okay, here's the resource of the quarter. I'm going to encourage you to read it. But then uh, we started doing some online uh, type setups till we could get to do some in person ones later on in in 2021. So those were some of the things that that we did. Good. Jason, um, how did your churches, how did you respond to COVID? Well, in addition to uh, a lot of the technology pieces that Mark and Wes just kind of talked about, we, we did engage in a lot of that as well. I also really wanted to try to help our pastors see what we can learn moving forward out of this. And I would say for me, one of the things I've really tried to communicate to them, one of the big takeaways for this was that our churches are way more adaptable and, and able to change uh, than we had previously thought, with the understanding that the reason they were able to change is that they understood the why of why we needed to make the changes that we made, why we needed to go digital for a time, why we needed to take the precautions that we were taking. And so the, the church members were, were very adaptable to change, and it was because they understood the, the reason why we needed to do that. And so moving forward out of the pandemic, at whatever point we finally get there, um, realizing that the church is able to change. It's just a matter of understanding the why of, of change uh, moving forward. So that was kind of the big takeaway. And I've really tried to, to uh, encourage our pastors and point them in that direction. Uh, but not just that one, but just all the things that we've learned. How can we take what has happened and, and then learn from it moving forward? So, Right. Um, I think about the old adage, necessity is a mother of invention. And, um, you know, sometimes when we're forced into those situations, then all of a sudden we become creative or we we're become entrepreneurial and that kind of thing. And I think in that regard, COVID really did have a silver lining in that in some ways it pressed us to do things and to try things that, you know, we never would have tried before um, like that. So I think that's, that's kind of a good thing. And I, we're a lot more adaptable than we ever thought we would be. But um, Mark, tell us now, when you think about your, your churches now, what are some challenges that your churches are currently facing? They're kind of on the other side of the pandemic, hopefully, but what challenges do you think they face now? Well, I think the burnout's real. I think research would prove that. I was in the nine, I was in uh, the Metro New York area during 9-11. I was at a church in New Jersey, and what I watched was how many pastors resigned? I think there's a lot of data that backs that up in the, in the couple of years following that. And I think we're seeing it here. So we've had three different pastors resign. We've had one, one of our churches that was a recent church plant just shut down and close altogether. You know, like he, he made all the decisions on his own. So I think we, we're, we have that. I think we have the social media face-off, whatever you want to call that. I know it's basically where ideology is trumping theology. And people are really wanting to air out their opinions above scripture and to really put that out there. And I think that's, of course, that's going to be an ongoing issue, uh, the, the politics online. And to really, uh, I know Henry Blackaby challenged me years ago to, to, to not stoop down to that, but to rise above that and not, not engage with that. So I think those are some of the current challenges that are at the forefront of what we're facing. Good. Um, Wes, what about you? 
Well, seeing as how we had a leadership gap for some time before I came here and then, you know, 2020 COVID hit, you know, we're still a little bit fragmented. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that, that we face as an association is trying to get our churches to to connect a little bit more together. Um, we pray for unity a lot. It's not that we're there's disunity or animosity. It just we're very fragmented. And so we've we've really tried to help them uh, see the, the good things that can happen when we come together and and trying to help them begin to pray together and, and really trying to emphasize that among our pastors has been something that, that I've been trying to encourage. We did um, have a, a really bad tragedy here in our community in April of 2021 where uh, an entire family, a, a son and mother and stepfather, were killed along with two sheriff's deputies. And once that incident happened, I realized that our community uh, seems to be together, but the faith community is very fragmented. Uh, they 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 may know of one another, but they rarely engage one another or work together. And that goes along with churches within our association and both outside of our association. So we've really tried to emphasize, hey, let, let's begin to, to at least pray together. Uh, so we, we have a, a weekly Monday prayer time on the telephone with our pastors. And, and then this month particularly, we're really emphasizing with our pastors a Wednesday prayer time. Um, one of those was in person. The rest were virtual, but we're challenging one another to fast and pray on Wednesdays together. And then we'll have an emphasized prayer time once a month in honor of one of our older pastors who just passed away a few weeks ago. His heart was to really see pastors and churches come together and pray. And so that that's one of the things that we're trying to do to kind of bridge the gap, so to speak, of the fragmentedness of our, our churches. Yes, um, being a North Carolina girl, I know a little bit about your area, and it's a very mountainous area. It's, it's Western North Carolina, and so I think you have uh, some of the, probably the internet challenges up there, and maybe some of the mountain culture is up there, and then if you've had 18 months without a direct admissions, then you kind of have a, a triple whammy there as you try to work and minister there in that area. But Jason, you live uh, like in Metro Atlanta, even it's on the outskirts there. What churches, what challenges do you see your churches facing now? Um, I think with the mix of digital as well as in-person worship um, and just all of the things that we face this year, one of the things that our churches are dealing with is what are the right metrics to use in figuring out where where we are? And I don't necessarily think this is an unhealthy thing. I think for a long time, we've, we've trusted just in uh, worship attendance and those kind of numbers to kind of figure out whether the church is healthy or not. And those aren't really always the best indicator. You can have a lot of people and, and, and be really, really shallow. And so uh, from a, from a uh, spiritual growth standpoint, uh, helping our churches figure out what metrics to use to, to see whether the church is in fact uh, growing and healthy uh, in, in biblical terms has been, so, so that has brought this, I think this was a challenge that actually was pre-COVID. It's just a matter, it's just that COVID kind of brought this to the forefront and caused people to really look at it um, and so that, that's been one of the things that, that, uh, we've seen people facing also just figuring out how to minister. Like, so, uh, particularly on the more rural side of ours, uh, a lot of our pastors focused on hospital visits and those kinds of things, uh, you know, as ministry to families in their church. And when the hospitals say that visitors are not allowed in, that suddenly changes how you minister to your people. And so figuring out how to, um, how to have effective ministry to people digitally um, it has been an interesting thing for a lot of our pastors to deal with. And then also how to figure out how to reach people outside of the church. Now, being able to have streaming service, uh, their services streamed has been a great blessing in terms of uh, getting the message out to people. And we've seen people be able to have ministries that are impacting people in New Mexico and Boston. And we've had churches talk about how uh, they've, they've, they've had people in, in other states and around the world watching and even sending in money to the church, which is kind of a bizarre reality to, to have ministries that aren't just local, but are actually expanding to, to reach people uh, throughout the U.S. and around the world. Um, so that's been a challenge. And then we also have seen, and this is, this is not going to sound like a challenge, <laughs> uh, but uh, we've seen... Uh, the majority, if not almost all of our churches experience increased finances. So giving has been really, really up 
Um, and, and actually, when we're listening to what Dave had to say, that actually makes sense. When you see that the amount of money that people have in their bank accounts, we see giving uh, be able to be increased, but then figuring out how to rightly steward those finances in a way that's not just like wasting money now, and then they find hard, uh, financial hardships later on. So being wise about how they they deal with these uh, this financial blessing has been an interesting topic of conversation amongst um, our churches as well. So those are the those are the, some of the things that we we faced. In addition to what Mark and Wes also shared, we've seen a lot of that as well. Have you been able to uh, encourage your churches or help them with uh, direct them into giving paths if they've had an abundance of funds? Uh, yes, we have. Um, we've done a number of those things. Or as with everything, I don't want to get into a whole lot of detail, but, you know, there are, uh, there are a lot of interesting conversations happening among our churches about, about giving and about how they're going to steward those resources, um, both conversations about cooperative program stuff, as well as conversations about, uh, we've seen a, and this is a blessing, and I'm not, uh, I, I hesitate to say very much about this too, but like we've seen, it has registered a blessing for our association in terms of, because church's money has increased, many of them give on a percentage, and so we have seen our, our monetary income increase based on the church giving. And, uh, and so uh, we, we've had a lot of conversations about that. Um, yes. Good, good. That's good news. I was glad to hear that, you know, when, um, Dave was talking about the money and the trillions and all that kind of stuff. And I thought we were all, I thought all, we were all spending it. I didn't realize we, everybody was saving. So that's kind of good good news to hear that. Um, I've got my cup of coffee right here. And I wondered, you guys, if you were sitting down with a, over at a coffee shop with a, one of some of the director of missions that are on here right now, what would you like to tell that pastor? If you had a heart to heart with them, what would you tell the uh, associate? What would you like to tell them? Mark, what, what would you say to the director of missions that are listening here if you had some coffee with them? Well, I would say this could be the greatest ministry opportunity of your lifetime. So one resource, I think I've already mentioned Henry Blackaby, but one of my top podcasts is the Richard Blackaby Leadership Podcast. And he takes a biography every month or so. And one question they ask often is, is does that person make history? Is that person great? Was he going to be great already? Or did history help make him or her? And you're like, you start to think about, the, the people that we think of as great heroes, uh, you know, Winston Churchill or Harry Truman or Abraham Lincoln, it was during times of war and crisis. It's like when things were going bad, they provided strong leadership. And I think that is something I would reach out to every pastor and say, you know, this is your opportunity, you know, and I know Hebrews talks about not shrinking back, you know, but to, to stepping up especially in a during a time of crisis where it looks like it's going to be unending. It's not, but it looks like it is. What, what better time for a, a leader to step up and make the most of this opportunity? And I, I think like Jason talked a little bit about with giving, but it's so much more than giving. You know, you're offering hope. You're offering unity. You're offering all sorts of things in this era in which we live. Um, yes, he didn't make any mistakes about putting us as us to serve right now in this place and in this time in history. And so I think, um, you know, he provides for us and he'll, um, he provides wisdom when we ask abundantly. And so I feel like, you know, let's give it a go and, and see and try things. And I think about the challenges that they had in World War II. I love history, Winston Churchill and all of those guys and how they stepped up to the plate. And I feel like, um, you know, God will be with us. He promises that to us as well. So, um, Wes, what would you say to a pastor, or to a pastor, a director of missions over a cup of coffee? Man, Mark and Kim, after that, I'm ready to charge hell with a water pistol. Let's go. Uh, let's, let's go. Get it. Uh, no, I, I would, I would tell them, that don't give up. Um, that, that's the first thing is, is hang in there. Don't give up. Keep going. Um, one thing I would also say, though, is take care of yourself. Uh, it's important that we take care of ourselves now, um, spiritually, mentally, physically. I know that's one of the things that I've really tried to step up on my game is my physical, taking care of my physical body. I've not been doing a great job of that, and I think that that would be uh, what I would say. But, you know, don't give up. Keep going and, and take care of yourself uh, because as AMS is, there's pastors out there who need us and pastors, there are churches who, are, who need you. So hang in there. 
Jason, how about you? Uh, I would say um, you're not alone. This is uh, the tendency among pastoral ministry anyway is to feel isolated and alone. And we all know this. We, we talk with pastors all the time who, um, who express that. But uh, COVID kind of amplified that greatly. And so um, I think reminding uh, them that there are other uh, men that God has called to serve in this way, and you are not alone. Um, and so take advantage of the partnerships that God has placed in your life, the relationships that you are able to uh, kind of commiserate together sometimes, but also rejoice together about what God is doing. Uh, take advantage of those and, and, and uh, be willing to share and open up and, and talk honestly about where, where God is leading and what he's doing and, um, and where your church is and find the, the camaraderie of, of building those kind of relationships. Good, good. Um, I don't want to tell my age here or anything, but I do remember it back in the day when I did a lot of training conferences and that kind of thing, and we would have big associational meetings and do trainings and that kind of stuff. And with that all looks very differently now because it's the, the grouping of lots of people together, the gathering of people is really not the norm. How have you guys responded to this training opportunity? How do you train your people? Or do you, do you have the big training events or how, how, what does that look like in your association? Well, Kim, our, our state convention runs 200 people. So that's just in a Sunday school class that you have at your church. You know, so it's like, for us, it looks a little different. But we, we really have really worked on these webinars. Of course, we hand our books out. We have continued to have our association meetings uh, with masks in the places here in the Madison area. But we've continued to give out books. And then, of course, we've had a, numerous different webinars uh, every couple months or so. And uh, like, like one, one webinar that was particularly effective was a guy named Steve Long did it. Uh, he used to be a director of missions AMS in the Northwest Ohio group. And he did one on what type of leader are you? And we've actually had several people reach out to him after that. But that really helped that those webinars really can cut down on isolation. Another one is for those that are willing to get together, uh, we have gotten together in person. And so I know our uh, our climate here is different in the Madison area compared to maybe the rural areas politically. So and we have different mandates in different places. But we, we've tried to respond by acknowledging that, that there is a great desire for people to get together. Wes? Uh, similar to Mark, you know, we've taken advantage of technology, using that resource of the quarter to, you know, emphasize some type of particular idea or um, strategy. We started uh, with flickering lamps. I really felt like that was something that, that our churches needed to, to begin to look at and to use. But um, one of the things that I've done in regard to that is, is, ask pastors or created just a pastors group for that. So um, encouraging both pastors and lay leaders to go through the same resource, we would do it twice. Uh, and everything we're doing now is a hybrid. So we're, um, you know, offering both in-person and online opportunities. And then we created a, a YouTube channel to be able to upload that content to the YouTube channel. Uh, now, with the pastor's content, I continue to keep it unlisted and closed. Uh, so that way I can just share the link with just pastors because I want pastors to to um, have confidence in being able to when they're in those groups to be able to share and uh, it not necessarily be out there for for just anybody but uh, as far as the lay leader trainings that we're recording and doing we're posting those to the youtube channel and it's been slightly um it's been picking up as far as uh, involvement and engagement so we're starting to see a few more views on certain things but we're still pushing those out through social media through our emails um and hopefully this fall we're going to have our first in-person annual meeting and so that'll be one of the first big things that that we've done this fall uh in person but everything else has kind of been in small groups or hybrid type stuff jason how about you uh, we also have done a lot of um uh, 
online stuff. Um, but the biggest thing that has happened for us, and actually this started pre-COVID, uh, we have moved to um, small cohorts of uh, pastors. Um, I'm, calling, I'm calling them PODs, uh, which stands for Pastor Occupational uh, development teams, and uh, it's basically discipleship groups of of uh, key church leaders. So we're starting. We started with pastors. We're about to expand to other areas of ministry, but but the groups are no more than four or five um, in each one. And uh, before we were doing that, we had we had monthly um, like pastor roundtable meetings. We would we were averaging about six or seven guys showing up for that. Um, now with these cohorts, with the number that we're having, we're over twenty that are meeting every month. Uh, over 20 people who are meeting every month. We have five groups that have started. Um, and it's been great to see this, like this has become the the go-to meeting for the guys that are involved in this. Um, and it's given them the opportunity, not just to, we're, we're reading books together, um, we're praying together, we're, we're, but it's also just sharing about what's going on in life and ministry. And it's allowed them to build these relationships with other pastors that they did not have before. And it's been it's just been a really beautiful thing to see that it's not just showing up, uh, seeing somebody for a few minutes at a, at a large pastor's gathering and then not speaking again until the next month. These guys are, uh, are texting each other in the middle of the month, praying for each other. Whenever there's a specific need in their church, they're sharing it with one another and responding and praying. It's been really an incredible thing to see this, this these relationships bloom um, in that. So we've really kind of gone all in on that. And we're about to begin um, focusing on... <clears throat> Uh, staff members of, of various and trying to do like, uh, you know, similar staff. So we'll have student cohorts, we'll have children's ministry cohorts, music cohorts, those kind of things. So um, I'm, I'm really excited about what God's doing through that and looking forward to seeing kind of that expand. Um, but then we've also encouraged and pointed people toward uh, partnership uh, ministries uh, who have been on conferences. So like we had the Spark Conference a couple of weeks ago and um, and just trying to to make sure that everybody's aware of what opportunities are out there for training. Um, that even during this time uh, where we're not meeting together, uh, we were to have a, um, uh, we were planned to have a vacation Bible school training back earlier in the year. And uh, Kim, you know about this. So uh, we uh, it did not come together because of the COVID spike that was happening and it, just a lot of things going on. We decided not to have the big conference, but instead we provided the opportunity for churches and we would send uh, send some of the leaders who were supposed to be at the conference. Uh, we sent them to individual churches and they did trainings and ended up being a great thing for the churches to take advantage of that. And it was a way for us to be able to bless the churches and, and help out with that. So um, uh, we just have tried to be as creative as possible in how can we address the specific needs that the churches have while at the same time, not becoming a super spreader event. Um, so that's what we're doing. Yep. I remember helping you with one of those events. And when I was at the church, they had, I think, 10, 12, 15 people there and for the meeting. And we had a great time. They were excited. They were ready to go. And it was fun being there and training them and, and just for those right there. Um, let's see. Somebody's got a question here. Let's see. Jason, do the cohorts study the same materials each month? And do you lead each one? Tell us a little bit about those courts. Because I was asking, I wondered too, do you have an agenda? What does that look like? So, uh each one is slightly different just because I, I try to work off of the personalities of the guys that are in there. So we have some like really like task oriented guys and man, we get through, we, we do our stuff and we go through, we have some that they would sit there and talk all day if, if they could. And I have to kind of rein them in a little bit. Um, we're um, so what we have been doing is um, to begin with, I allowed them to, we kind of talked through what was going on in the church and, and in their lives. And then we picked a book that we wanted to read through that would address some of that. And I brought some samples of stuff um and so we we take a chapter or depending on what book it is we'll take a couple of chapters uh each month read through them and then discuss them uh then we go around and share what uh, is going on in their church and in their life and how we can pray for one another um and then sometimes we won't ever get to actually talking very much about the book because somebody will come to the meeting with uh, a particular issue that they're dealing with and we'll need to spend the whole time just talking through that offering ideas and letting them kind of and so it's turned into it, it just we never know from one time to the next I usually try to uh, to meet around either breakfast or lunch um, so that we can it's it's a time where we're not necessarily taking a ton of time out of their day they were already going to be stopping for lunch and so we we, we have uh, 
sort of design them around a meal that we eat together. Um, I do lead each one. Um, I had originally intended to not do that. I was going to get them started and then let them go. Uh, but what I discovered in meeting with them is that uh, it gave me, it gives me an opportunity every month to sit down for an hour and a half or so with four of my guys at a time and really hear what's going on in their life. And so the relational component for me as associational guy in their life has been so elevated that I, I can't give that up. Um, it's just been a great, great way for me to build those relationships and, and know what's going on in a majority of our church's lives as we're meeting together. So uh, so I am going to continue meeting with them. I, I know that I'm not going to be able to meet with all of the groups of staff and all that kind of stuff. And so we're working on uh, raising up leaders that will be able to help with that. Um, but for my pastors in particular, I am sticking with all of those groups. And we're about to start um, the Gospel Driven Church um, is the book that uh, uh, three of the of the pods are about to start um, in this next month. So, Cool. Cool. Um, quickly, let's, uh, what is your go-to resource, Mark? You mentioned assessments and stuff. What, what is your go-to resource? Well, I too, I've had 16 years of assessments. So I've, I've used an awful lot of them uh, in assessing church planters. But the number one assessment I'm using right now, it measures talent analytics. It's career suitability, eligibility. It does measure behaviors, preferences, and tendencies. It's called the Harrison Assessment. And the Harrison Assessment was developed by a guy named uh, Dan Harrison, who actually had three PhDs by the time he was age 30 in unrelated fields, mathematics, uh, organizational development, and counseling psychology. And we have actually been using that on pastors as pastors are considering resigning or leaving right now. Like I've got one guy right now, he's, he knows he's not going to be there much longer. And so I'm using that on him. Uh, but you start to think about it, you can use it on many lay people because that's what we see in the headlines pretty much every day is the, the shifts in the workforce, people changing careers. You know, of course, there's so many people in the service industry that aren't going to be going back to what they were doing. And the Harrison assessment in 20 minutes, it measures so, different, so many different things. It actually runs 33 reports. So it's, it's actually just really awesome. And that has been something I actually got trained for during the credential, uh, during the crisis a year and a half ago, and then been utilizing that and getting other people trained to do it as well. So that's been a great help to us. How can they access the Harrison assessment? Well, uh, you can go to harrisonassessments.com to explore more of it. And I can put that in the chat area. Uh, you can obviously get, get with me as well. I would be glad to uh, talk with anybody if they want to know more about it and show them sample reports. But uh, that would be, I'd love to discuss it further with people uh, if you would like to talk, but that is some, that's how you can get to it the fastest. I took the Harrison assessment and I didn't flunk it. So that I considered it a success. There you go. Hey, Kim, <laughs> you can, you can speak to it. It's, it's a valuable tool. For it people. was very good. And it pegged me right right on you know and so um i like the thing that it showed your uh, your real like with one characteristic and it showed your strengths how and the weaknesses and kind of how that balanced out so that you knew exactly kind of where you were with all of that stuff it was very we good. call we call them derailers, no derailers. Else, yeah derailers. But, and yeah, then the great, the great news about the harrison is it doesn't put a label on you and it also you can also make changes I'm not a DISC or an otter or a beaver or, you know, right. caller, any, not all that kind of stuff. So, That's right. yeah, all that. Uh, Wes, what's your go-to resource right now? You know, I, I mentioned earlier that one of the first resources I introduced our churches to was Flickering Lamps. They really resonated with that. That's been a great resource for us. Uh, Rainers, all of Rainers small books have been something that I've really um, kind of pointed them to because they're small, practical, easy to go through. We just finished up post-quarantine church uh, as, as this um, quarter's resource. I think that really connected with, with some people. Um, 
really trying to think more small church resources simply because we do have a number of smaller churches and uh, I don't know if, if you know Carl Vader's is um, one of the, one of the good ones in small church resources his um, book Grasshopper Myth is something that we're going to be looking at coming up and, and trying to bridge the gap between uh, the larger churches and the smaller churches and help help us all realize that you know we're all created uniquely uh, in size but that small doesn't mean that they do small things if you can get smaller churches to think small and realizing that it helps them kind of navigate things a lot easier uh, then you know those are some of the things that we're thinking about again just because uh, a lot of our churches are smaller in size but I, I want to help them realize that that small in size doesn't mean that they do small things yeah. Jason, what's your go-to resource? Uh, so I already mentioned the gospel driven church that we're doing with right. our pods. Um, we also, uh, so back from, uh, back at the convention in, um, June at SBCAL, uh, got to hear Will Heath talk about, um, succession planning. And so in his book, Embracing Succession, I've been, uh, kind of diving into that and I've got several pastors who are looking to retire, uh, soon. And so trying to figure out um, how to help them and, and thinking through uh, helping them plan and, and help their churches plan for the future has kind of been where I've been at the past couple of months. So good, uh, those good. are my two. Well, thank you so guys so much for sharing today. Uh, if you've got any other questions, feel free to put those in the chat and we'll try to maybe get to those. But Larry, I'm going to kind of throw it back to you because I know you want to introduce some of the uh, people that are on here that AMS is. Can you take it away? I sure can. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. And thank you to our panelists that helped us today. Mark, good to see you and Wesley and my friend on the west side of Atlanta, since so I'm on the east side. Um, and uh, Jason, thank you for your help and being part of our panel today. I hope you got some good resources. I did from uh, what these guys have shared today. Um, I also want to recognize uh, someone that kind of works all behind the scenes on Daryl's staff that has helped us as well as Kim with our programming. And that is Randy Elster. Uh, Randy's on the line with us today. He does a lot of the background work and uh, a lot of the office work for us. There's Randy. Thank you, Randy, for all the work that you've done and helping us with the chat box as well. It's been very good for us to be here today. I want to recognize those that may be new to NOBA, Maybe perhaps you've not even been experienced in a NOBA conference at all. So if you're new to this uh, format of being a part of NOBA and being online with us today, we'd like, we know there's a lot of turnover in missionaries right now. And so if you'd like to introduce yourself, I'd like for you to do that at this point. Who we got this new? I'll go first. My name's Doug Vaughn, and I'm with the uh, Sierra Baptist Association, and I'm going to be uh, stepping into the role that Eddie Miller has had with our uh, area churches for the last 30 years. Eddie's retiring uh, next April, and so we're working on that uh, succession, um, and I'm working full-time right now. Just wrapped up a pastorate of 20 years. Uh, back in June, and so now I'm working with our Sierra Baptist uh, for these last few months and just learning the ropes and getting into uh, the deep of it. <laughs> well, we're glad you're online with us, Doug, and uh, welcome aboard, and uh, you got pretty big shoes to fill there with Eddie. Yes, sir. Big, big boots for sure. That's right. Uh, so we're thankful for Eddie being online with us as well, and, Introducing you to Nova by having you with us today. Who Glad else to be is here. New? Thank you. Who else is new? Uh, I'm Ron Blankenship, and I'm a director of missions, associational missionary in uh, Montgomery County in Maryland. It's Montgomery Baptist Association in Maryland, just on the edge of D.C. in the Silver Spring, Bethesda area. Been here 21 years, and uh, I've gone to a couple of your conferences before when they were live, but this is my first time. I've uh, shared with you online. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Ronnie. Hi, my name is Jerry Connor, uh, and I'm with the Kansas City, Kansas Baptist Association. Um, Donnie Simpson had been in this role until February, or, and, uh, and then I've stepped in uh, since February. 
So uh, this is my first time and Donnie had, had forwarded me this, the information about this webinar. And so I was happy to jump on. Welcome aboard. Good to meet you for the first time. Any other new guys that are online with us today? I know we got some retirees or some other guys that are joining me in the month of the uh, ranks of the retired guys. Um, and I think one of those is Mike Pennington. Am I right, Mike? Yes, I'm retiring at the end of this year. And uh, I announced my retirement early back in April so that we could put a succession plan in place. And so the search team is already working. They Maybe centering in on somebody pretty soon. So we're hoping for a seamless transition. But after 26 years, I'm um, uh, going to be, uh, as one of my friends says, repositioning. And another friend says for redeployment. And so repositioning for redeployment, continuing to work in spiritual direction, uh, the Enneagram, and, uh, and also soul care, uh, caring for yourself for the sake of others, uh, taking care of the inner person. And uh, so, so my wife and I've got a lot of exciting things to do in retirement. Well, thank you, Mike. And thank you for your service through the years. Uh, you got one more than I did in, in, the, in the bank. So we're glad to have you online and congratulations on your upcoming retirement. Thanks so uh, much. Mike also put in the chat about the Enneagram. I have a church that's doing that, but I don't have any association that I know of that's doing the Enneagram testing, the personality and leadership assessment. If you do, you might want to respond to uh, Mike so that he'll be aware of that. But I do have a church that is pretty big on Enneagrams. Any other retirees? Well, we got uh, still got uh, my friend um, Daryl Price on the line with us. I would like to introduce you to the work that we're going to be doing at our national summit. The national summit is going to be on February the 17th. And uh, we're in the process of lining up those that will be working with us. And I want to let you know what that's going to look like. Uh, at this point, it's going to be an online uh, summit. Uh, Randy just put it up. It's going to be called Accelerate. And I already have one commitment from Willie McLaurin with the, uh, uh, the executive committee of our convention is going to be there to help us with the, and our theme being to uh, accelerate, he's going to help us with alignment with the 2025 initiative of Southern Baptist. So he's already committed to doing that. We got some others that are going to be involved as well that will be talking about tune up, which will be about church strengthening. We'll have someone to talk about detailing, which will hopefully be one of our friends from Glue, and then someone about fueling up. In the middle of that, we're going to also uh, do a church planner roundtable, probably during the lunchtime. So that will give you something to look forward to. Registration is already open, so you can go ahead and sign up for that. Pay your uh, fees at NOVA. The website for NOVA is... Uh, is uh, www.nobasbc.org, and we'd encourage you to do that. Randy's already put the registration up there as well, and uh, we'll be glad to have you a part of that. Daryl, do you have anything else you want to share with us today? Sure. Um, one is thank you for the opportunity to help be part of this. Thank you, Eddie. You're the one that invited me in. I'm glad you're seeing you jump back in. But Eddie Miller, when he asked me to consider leading uh, and being part of NOBA, it's interesting. You know, I have a philosophy of abundance in the wisdom. There's abundance in the wisdom of counselors. And that night, whenever I had the opportunity to consider that, I had Jason Laddermilk and Neil Hughes and several other longtime prayer partners and friends pray with me about leaning in. And I'm glad to be part of what we're doing together. And this is refreshing. Like I have, <clears throat> you know, four pages of notes that I took today. I got thoughts that I hadn't been thinking because of the great presentation. And that's, to me, what I would tell you is just learning together with people who want to learn and grow. You know, I, I heard, you know, I, I was with Jason Laddermilk last week. Uh, he was doing some all huggy Felix kind of stuff. And uh, that's another whole story, but he was all doing all this kind of manby pamby stuff. But long story short is uh, as we were together uh, in, in a big group meeting, 
that um, that that even though I've heard about his pods, I learned more today about his pods than I have heard in the last season. So it's just the the different intersections give us more opportunity to learn. And, and just the good example, just hearing just a minute ago from, from Doug Vaughn sharing about the transition plan that he and Eddie's working together, that's good stuff. And Mike, you know, and, you know, as you transition and you transition well, those are things we need to hear. So I'm just glad to be part of that. We are going to be pushing out several different learning opportunities. I have been so blessed by just strategic partnerships and you know like for Kim and, and Mark Millman you know the, the you know just looking back at the Harrison assessments and you know Kim being able to lean into that with Mark it's it's really amazing I remember years and years and years ago when I was a church planter there was a lady named Kim Harris that wrote a book on welcome to God's family um, <laughs> and I just did that because she said she didn't want to talk about how old she was but uh, she wrote when she was really young and, um, Very young. and uh, but as I was a church planter, I my, when my children received Jesus, I wanted to make sure they wasn't just following a family tradition of a dad that maybe a dad decision, please dad, but that they really have a connection with Jesus. And 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 when they came to Christ, um, I was able to, you know, help them walk through welcome to God's family that Kim Harris wrote years and years ago. But I say this about that is here's what I see with NOBA. NOBA is opportunity for the best thought leaders that are in the trenches doing it day in, day out to come together. And that's what we're trying to harness. So thank you, Eddie Miller, Larry Cheek, and others who have just paved the way. And I know y'all are, you know, getting ready to, you know, kind of get redeployed and do whatever is next in, in your retirement years. But thank you for le leaving and, and having such a great foundation for us. So I would say, look, be on the lookout for some learning opportunities that are going to keep coming. And I would also, oh, let me, yeah, Randy, he keeps us on track. We yeah. have a, a, a webinar that we're going to do on the pillars of an effective association. And we have some stuff we're going to be pushing out that just begins to say, how do we get back down to the, to the foundational stuff of what an association's built on? And we're combining the, the thoughts of, of whether it's the nominee or, or glue or others that we have the opportunity to partner with but how do we go back to a biblically driven model that at the end of the day, if I stand before any church, anywhere, any pastor, you know, I can hold up my inspired word of God and say, you know what, this is why we do what we do. And it's not because of a, a, a popular culture or a crisis. We're doing what we're doing because Jesus um, you know, and what he has said in his word that we are really about making disciples that make disciples. So I was about before, you know, again, this is going to be coming up and, and we're going to launch this October 4th as another learning opportunity. But I was just about to say to Eddie Miller, Eddie, thank you. And I was going to see if you have something to share with us, your words of wisdom and, and uh, opportunity to communicate as we, you know, kind of uh, doing that. I don't have a clue with time. Uh, that's something that Kim and Others will keep me on track all the time, but I just say, "What Eddie, what you got? Well, you got nine minutes, the way I understand it. Five minutes. Five. Oh, she's already she's already waving me down. Uh, hey, our belief is from the very beginning that we learn best from one another, that our best resources are sitting right here in these offices and around. Some of us are home officing. Some of us are doing whatever. It takes to tree the coon and that's the main that's our main focus here with noba um and uh i'm gonna be stepping aside stepping out stepping somewhere i might be available to do some uh some strategy work or I, i'll still take a phone call from anybody but uh we just want to help and that's why noba's here and that's about all i have to say about that Daryl, if I could step in and close this out, uh, glad to have Eddie on the line. Thank you for those words of wisdom. Uh, you always got something to say to us, Eddie, and you're talking about tree and the coon, and so I understand that too. And uh, thank you for sharing that with us. I don't know if that came from your experiences out west 
or if that came from your Tennessee days, but uh, we'll take it for whatever it's worth, all right? Um, I want to say thank you all for being a part of what we've done today, the guys and gals that have helped us to do this, uh, to make it uh, successful. And I hope that uh, you have learned something today. Uh, I do want to say that, uh, just like Mike said a moment ago, uh, and uh, has already been uh, said by Eddie and by Doug, uh, I'm also working on a succession plan. And so um, I think that is the way to go. And the reason I'm doing that, uh, Mike and Eddie, is because once we get someone that um, is in the role, my position is going to cease and I plan to step out and somebody else step right in. And I don't want to lose a year to two years of lostness in our communities by not having leadership in that role. Jason spoke to that a moment ago about succession as well. I think that's also for missionaries. And I would encourage any of you that are doing so to uh, try to do that as God leads you to do. And when you're to that point of succession, that God will have somebody available to you to step in when you step out. Let's pray together and thank you so much for being online with us today. Father God, we're so thankful for the opportunity we have to be together. Thank you, Lord, for all that has been shared, for the opportunity we have to learn from each other. Thank you for Dave and the work that he's doing with Generis and for his generosity today in leading our session on the K economy. Thank you for our panelists that have been so helpful to us and helping us to understand what they're doing through this COVID relationship. Lord, we realize today that we're still under some COVID restrictions in different areas and in different places, but we also realize that you're still on the throne. You want the gospel to go out regardless of all the challenges that we're facing. Lord, help us to be gospel-driven people that will lead our churches and the people that we come in contact with to be on mission for you. We ask God your blessings on us as we depart from this call to our responsibilities for the rest of this day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.